Hey, Mike. Good morning, Doug. How are you doing today? Good, Mike. That's Mark. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I can't hear very well anyway. I basically listen to a little too much punk rock in my in my ute. Well, fortunately, technology can help, I guess, by boosting the audio. So we were going to have a talk at some time. Yeah. Um, it's... Uh, um, uh, do weekends work for you? Uh, usually. Um, my wife and I both paint, and we've had open studio the last couple of weekends. And this weekend is going to be kind of cleanup, so it's a little tricky. But the weekend after, is that good? Um, yeah, if I can, if I can remember, um, I, I, I will try. Um, well, and I'll, I'll, I'll nudge you with an email. And I'll nudge you from time to time. I'm, I kind of, you know, spontaneous connection um, works for me. Well, actually, try it's uh, try that because probably half the time it works. Yeah. With me. Good. Hi, Jerry. Good morning. Morning. Is Jerry talking? We can't hear you. Uh, do you hear there me you now? Know. Okay. There you are. Every now and then I have to replug my ear, my headset in. It's kind of weird. Um, it's interesting. Uh, your background is bl blue, your chair is blue, and your shirt is blue. It all goes together. Doo -doo 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 -doo. I come from planet blue. We are not permitted to wear anything else. Le bleu. Le bleu. Le bleu is, uh, I guess, doing very well in our friend the Euro uh, 2020s, I think. I was just going to say that. Yeah. Yeah. As opposed to the Azuri. And they, actually, the Azuri are doing pretty well, too. The Azuri, uh, that would be the Italians, right? Exactly, who are also blue. Yes, okay. <laughs> I remember being in uh, North Beach when the Italians uh, won the World Cup. We watched it at an uh, Italian bar. Boy, oh boy, was that fun. Oh, that must be fun. Yeah, oh, so I, went, was great. I went to a game in San Francisco uh, that involved the Brazil team, and it was a Brazilian bar, and it was just wild and crazy, but Brazil lost. Yes. Was that the German? Uh, no, it wasn't the German disaster. Uh, that was. Which was a crazy thing to watch. Yeah. Um, it was, um, you know, good for the Germans. So <laughs> maybe, maybe the Brazilians will learn uh, um, less Schadenfreude. <laughs> exactly. Hey, Gil, how you doing? Good morning, folks. Morning. Good morning. Jerry, I'm going to probably have to leave about nine today. Okay. Sounds cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say uh, when I when nobody could hear me, I was saying that it's supposed to hit, get close to 98 or something like that this week here. And we've got, I think, mild temperatures relative to the heat wave that's whacking across the southwest of the country. So yeah, LA Times had an interesting story this morning <clears throat> talking about both the heat and, and historic dryness, which is a bad combination. <clears throat> Yep. And there's an article in the New York Times this morning, I think it's the Times, that says that the Earth is absorbing way more heat than the than the estimates had. So mm -hmm. yeah. Um, things yeah. are not going well. Yeah. Well, that's gonna be the story for a while now. It is. Uh, actually it's not a, it's a Washington Post story. I'll paste it in the Mattermost chat. Find Mattermost uh, chat. Yeah. So many tabs, so little time. Exactly, exactly. It's raining websites. And I'm, I'm, I, I love BrainBox, um, but I got to spend regular time harvesting that, don't I? You do, exactly. And the thing Gil just mentioned is, Gil is experimenting with the brain, the software that I like to use. And there's a way you can email yourself links, basically. You can bookmark them for later retrieval and curation. And the, the little artifact is called brain box because there's a little icon of the box in the corner that you then click on and it says, hey, here's all the stuff that's stacked up for you to put away. And I, I forget it's there because I usually go straight and curate stuff you know, directly into the brain. Um, I've also been experimenting with Obsidian as <clears throat> potentially a better writing environment than the brain is, um, but it doesn't have that harvesting function. It's more of a manual task there. 
So um, we should do another show and tell at some point because there's a whole bunch of people that are in the cult of Rome. There's a yeah, settle, yeah. settle custom uh, fan clubs. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of communities built up around these different tools, mm -hmm. each of which is going a little frothy and crazy in, in their own tool set. Um, and I don't see a lot of cross-pollination, which would be really interesting. Yeah, and each of which has uh, people with voluminous YouTube offerings about what my workflow is and how I do all this. So it's, you know, pretending to be the answer, but it's you know, personal idiosyncratic and so forth. But in particular, Jerry, I'm not seeing a lot of the cross-fertilization. So I'm real interested in, in the flow between the brain and something like Obsidian Rome, what have you. I completely agree. Totally agree. Um, uh, Paul and, Crafell, and, and then there's a list. then there's the, the you know the OGM list which has gotten very busy this last week or two. It has. I can barely keep up, and I've got comments I want to make back, and I'm like, wow, where does this all go? <laughs> I know it's kind of crazy. Um, hey everybody, welcome to the Thursday uh, check-in call. Um, Paul Crafell nicely pointed out last week afterward that uh, the general rhythm of this, and he's totally right because this is just what I've been doing is that as everybody speaks, I jump in and I sort of take a turn at, at uh, if they said something that I can add to or whatever, I jump in and so forth. And I think that uh, partly, partly that's a piece of what makes these calls work and partly that's a, an assumption about things and how they work that doesn't need to happen. And there's a side conversation happening about let's experiment with the Thursday calls in, in much more interesting and radical ways. But, but today, maybe what I'll do is, as, as people check in, I'll just be quiet for a little bit and see who else wants to jump in and, and take a turn. And we'll do a wee little experiment that way uh, with this. Um, but, but of course, of course, um, I find it irresistible to, to pitch in with what I've seen and what's going on. So I will bite my tongue for a little bit. Um, one thing to think about is it would be great um, to alternate hosts, for example, for this call, perhaps. And it would be lovely to alternate hosts with somebody who is not a older white guy like me. Uh, so if, if you know anybody who think, who uh, would like to be, you know, take a turn, give it a try, uh, that would be awesome. I'd love to talk with them. Uh, there are no older white guys like you, Jerry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love being thought of as sweet generous, but... Uh, uh, but hey, there we go. Um, awesome. Uh, Grace, thank you for joining us. Uh, Ingrid, thanks for being here. Um, our normal habit here is we go around, uh, the, I go into gallery view and I, I sort of, uh, if, if somebody didn't make it into the room last week, I start with them and then I kind of work my way through a little bit uh, who's here. There's no deliverables from this call. This, these, these calls are not goal oriented. They're just, uh, I call it sort of dip and mix where I'm, uh, sort of dipping the ladle into the stream of activities that all of us are into that have anything to do with open global mind, which is the general umbrella here. And then when interesting things show up, we kind of mix the pot a little bit and people, we pitch in and help each other. We, we offer perspectives or articles or uh, whatever else is going on. Um, and this perfectly fine to pass as we go around. So if, if you don't feel like stepping in, that's great too. Um, and I will begin today actually with... Uh, Ken, Phil, Anthony. I know, first, Ken, how's that? Not sure I was prepared for that. Um, hello, everybody. Good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you might be in the world. Um, nice to see some, some uh, new faces here and some old faces. Scott, it's been a while since you've been here. Welcome back. Um, Oh, let me see. What am I doing? Um, I'm reading Bob Johansson's new book called Full Spectrum Thinking. Bob Johansson is a past president and now distinguished fellow at the Institute for the Future. And this book is all about um, moving beyond categories into um, what Robert Gilman would call th seeing things as territories and recognizing you can have multiple maps for the same territory. And uh, one of the things he talks about is that the future, getting the, the next 10 years will be very, very difficult. Um, it's also filled with amazing opportunities. And um, we'll, there'll be a shift for people who are successful in moving from certainty to clarity. So you'll know where you wanna go. Yes, Gil, they only do 10 years at a time at the Institute for the Future. But what's interesting is they go back at least 50. So they're working with a 60 year time frame. 
um they well, find that i was just not... laughing at the thought that only 10 years are going to be difficult I oh, okay <laughs> yeah i think i think we're in for a lot of that but the next 10 years is going to be particularly challenging um so it uh, iftf um goes back at least 50 years looking for signals and then um projects out 10 years in the future and they use a, a hindsight foresight insight and action model um and so this this thing that really caught my eye is is moving from uh certainty to clarity that you'll know where you want to go but you'll be very very flexible at how about how you'll get there and jerry i was thinking about april's uh flex mindset because it seems completely congruent with what bob's talking about in full spectrum thinking so um that's just kind of on my mind right now um as we're sifting through our our uh, opportunities here as as ogm and there was something else i just read this morning um related to that related to ogm in the book which um yeah, I think it's it's there's a lot of talk in OGM about the future, but there's not a lot of talk about what, with the exception of our, our good pal Doug Carmichael, of really looking back over the last 50 years and what are the signals that we could be um, using to inform our view of how to get where we want to go to securing our future. Um, so I just thought I'd, I'd throw that out as, as a, perhaps a really interesting conversation starter. Good to be here. Hope everybody's doing well. It's getting hot here in California. Thanks, Ken. And I will resist all my urges to jump in right this second and see if anybody else would like to do so, because I was about to break discipline right there, because everything you said was exciting to me. But anybody else who'd like to jump in, please feel free. Well, I'll take I'll a step. Go ahead. Oh, oh. Anthony, do you want to go first, and then I'll go? Anthony, fill me. <laughs> okay, uh, didn't mean to jump. Uh, to, to, okay, anyways, uh, the I'm work. Uh, very interesting video I saw a couple couple weeks ago featuring. Uh, I'm in the systems thinking, and uh, Derek Cabrera, his life, Laura, Gerald Midgley, uh, Brad um, Taylor. They're pretty. They're pretty. At least what I could gather, they're pretty high up there in terms of uh, being authoritative, authoritative people on that. And to me, it was like a come clean moment. They, Midgley and uh, Eric said basically, you know, that there is no systems thinking. Uh, it's all a bunch of disparate things that could, can be used. I mean, every once in a while, like a, a causal loop diagram will be of eight or, eight or something like that. But actually, causal loop diagrams are relatively low impact on Donna, Donella Mills, Don, Donna, what's her name? Donella Meadows. Uh, uh, per, list, list, list of pressure points, i.e. that she talks about how, you know, looking at goals and how they all, all interrelate is way up there on top of looking at the potential impact, whereas looking at how to, you know, just feedback loops and variables is is way at the end of the list of 12 um, different things. So in terms of, um, in terms of that, yeah, the, the, basically there is no unified description of uh, systems thinking. And as, as I was just re referring to, there are also, there is no focus on the, the true priorities in system thinking. And I've done a lot of re research on it. Again, the, the true priorities are to focus on goals and the impact of goals and vision, whereas uh, feedback loops and what, et cetera, that's done at a more micro level, less impact has to be done, but less impact. So along those two parameters, both the, the, the integratedness of system thinking and the focus upon the, the true priority items uh, boy, that's wide open. And I, I know systems thinking, at least from what I gathered, is the, uh, everybody wants to jump into solving the world's big problems. That's, that's, that's great. But uh, to, in my mind, and you can, you know, anybody can challenge me on it, that requires systems thinking. In order to do systems thinking, we got to know what, it, how, what to do. Uh, so that's, that's what this, this project is on. What I could use, I mean, I made a lot of, I put a lot of effort in developing a, uh, it started off as a, as a, a STEM teaching program for kids at a Catholic high school near where I'm at, and it's turned into something else. Uh, but, um, uh, I, I'm making a lot of, I've, I've done video, um, videos and, uh, what do you call those PowerPoints based upon graphics that tie things together. Uh, what, what I could use is review, people reviewing it in terms of, you know, I think that I, so, you know, something for, for clarity and more importantly than that, there's, um, I mean, I could draw, I could take simple models of the business system of a business world and use that as a, as a walkthrough example of what to do. 
but there's uh, looking at things like goals and how they all interrelate. If you, in, in real business world, you got huge models. <laughs> And I can't do that, but so any feedback I could get in terms of, well, this, uh, I don't understand the point you're trying to make here, Tony. What do you, what do you mean by you got to de, you know, decompose the relationships as well as decompose the goals? It, it just, just doesn't come through. I mean, I think I'm being clear. I know, anyways, I think I'm being clear, but I could use help. That's, that's the, I started on, uh, what do you call that? Uh, what Mattermost. You call that? Mattermost, that's right. <laughs> I started a, a, a site there where I'm posting some some uh, representative samples and just soliciting feedback on what uh, what uh, um, how it comes across, both in terms of yeah, just feedback on how it comes across. Or uh, I'm also open to any other suggestions, but that's that's what I'm doing. Uh, Vincent and Mark, I think. I think with Phil. Oh, sorry. Was. Uh... It's okay. I can I can default to whoever. If, if ahead, anyone's, okay. I got the order wrong. So no worries. I'll just go quickly. Um, so I need to apologize. I'm not as up to date on the Mattermost and kind of general chats that have been going on this week. I've been been a bit uh, swamped. Um, but we had a really good session on Tuesday, talking through how we kind of activate some of these projects like Tony's within OGM. Um, I do think defining exactly what a project is and. I think Pete Kaminsky's done a bit of this with the sovereign um, breakout of what a sovereign needs. I think that's a great starting point, and then figuring out how the OGM can support projects like, if we want to, if we want to figure out a, a unified way of systems thinking, that would be great. Um, to Ken's, back to Ken's frame a bit. I do like the idea of mentioning what book we're reading at the moment. So I'm reading the media from Gutenberg to Google um, to understand how we basically got to where we are at the moment. Um, I'm trying to think as well. I had a had a really good session with a, a group called Future Space uh, yesterday. Um, they're a group of futurist, highly non-American, I would say. So it's a, it's a really nice group to engage with. Um, and I did mention OGM and I did have just put out an open call for people if they want to uh, come join some of our conversations. I think it would be good to start figuring out how we engage with groups like that. I know Bentley put in another group in, in the Mattermost that could be good to reach out to. Um, but yeah, I think it would be good to start moving that direction. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'm missing. Uh, did, a, did a deep dive into uh, Obsidian with Pete as well um, to figure out a bit more about our, our kind of GitHub and massive wiki setup. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it at that. Uh, Mark, I'll hand it over to you. You just remuted yourself. Yeah, I thought we were just commenting on Ken Homer. I just wanted to plus one uh, Bob Johansson, and I posted a uh, hour long um, uh, encounter uh, of Bob Johansson with um, Indian systems thinkers um, from India, and uh, I think it's a really interesting um, way to spend an hour. And I, I, I that was just a comment. I um, will pull back and let other people intro. Sounds great. Thanks, Mark. And I was just about to comment that me not sort of lightly shepherding the situation seemed to have fallen apart a little bit, but you just put us back on track. So I thank you for that. Um, that's awesome. And I had originally said Ken, and I've totally spaced on who I had in the original queue after Ken. Do you remember? I think, I think Vince was next after that. Uh, yeah, that's right. Ken, Vince, then Tony, I think is what I said. Cool. So um, I think this idea of the territory is fascinating and it it actually intersects with um a kind, a kind of project that i started yesterday um and i just wanted to screen share real quick because i don't know how best to describe this this yet um but if you could see my screen yep. um, i actually started um basically drawing out so I had some inspiration to like sketch out a literal territory of the different um, kind of category systems in Trove. So this is like, you know, the entertainment hub. Here's like all the different like sustainability, um, regenerative resource-based economy. And then you have like technology, entrepreneurship. And so I was like, okay, what, what if you could actually not just have one category system on a map, but overlay lots of different um, category systems all on one map. And so I started looking at all the different frameworks that exist that are all looking at the same world and the same 
really thing, but they're just kind of categorizing things and focusing in different ways. And so I found uh, Donut Economics, um, which has social and ecological categories. Um, the Barbara Marx Hubbard's 12 Sectors, um, which has a lot of overlap with the Donut Economics, except it also has added in things about spirituality, art and culture, um, and also on like design and like systems, um, which also are some things that um, I felt like are missing from the SDGs, um, which don't really talk about um, culture or media or the things that affect the way that we think about the world, um, as well as design. Um, and then there's also these three sectors that um, Solutionista, a woman named Trudy, came up with that combines the SDGs into wellness, um, ethics, and sustainability. Um, and then there's the categories um, in Trove, which are I'm calling the different like commons categories. Um, and so there's like 30 of these, um, like from ranging from like mental health to like mutual aid. Uh, and then I found planetary boundaries, which um, is from stock. Home Institute, I believe. Um, and I have Rockstrom and everybody. Yeah. What's that? Uh, Rockstrom and everybody researching at Stockholm, which I think is part of the donut economics framing. Oh, is it? Okay. Because they look super similar. Yeah. I think they're connected. I, I think that donut is basically you drop, you drop a donut on this kind of model and you talk about undershoot and overshoot. Cool. Okay. That's awesome. Uh -huh. um, yeah. That makes sense. Um, the, the last one I found is the IFF world system model from Buckminster Fuller. Um, but this one I also haven't explored too much. But yeah, what I, what I ended up trying to do, um, and I'll make this quick, but I basically started overlaying these systems onto each other. Um, so for example, you have the main like three uh, sectors of like sustainability, ethics, and uh, wellness. Um, and then on top of that, I put um, basically the donut economic model. Um, and then I added a few different sectors that I feel like are missing that are in common with these different areas. Uh, and then I overlaid on top of that the SDGs, which are kind of categorized to be like very close in this territory. So like, you know, the one about peace, um, but climate action is next to governance. You know, poverty and gender equality are next to um, arts, media, and culture, quality education, next to education. And then the donut economics models sit on top of this. Um, and then I also have the uh, Maslow's hierarchy, which fixes that little thing in the bottom. Um, and then the trove categories sit on top of that. So just, just some, a really cool um, visual way about how these categorization systems all interconnect um, so that when people are trying to speak different different languages but talking about the same things you could draw the connections like through these different layers um, and be able to translate ontologies and how they map with each other thanks vincent uh, grace you've got your hand up yeah, I like. Can you show me that drawing from the beginning, Vincent? I wanted to say something about that because that's a really good place for me to start introducing myself. Cool. Uh, the pencil one. That one, right? So um, my name is Grace. I've been working on currency design, and if you look at all these objects here, you'll notice that there's these rivers in between them, and none of those rivers are labeled. So what the heck is that? Like, what's the water? And the water is, um, I'm going to name a few things, but mostly we don't talk about them because we consider them the default or they're kind of invisible with us. It's like the fish is swimming in the water and there's like, what well, water, right? And so those rivers, you can, you can sh not show that now. I mean, it's, but that's the idea, right? The first one is money. Donut economics and all these things and all these systems we're looking at are inside of this idea that you trade things for equal value. And money is corrupted because it doesn't represent value. The things that we value most, air and relationships and clean water are devalued in monetary systems. So it's a mis 
uh, mislabeling. It's a tragic mislabeling. At the time we created money as human beings, we didn't think we could fish all the fish in the sea. So it did represent value at that time, but the situation is reserved, reversed. So that's the first kind of part of the river. Other things that um, are in that river are things like the regulatory environment. And I would put on top of that copyright and patent law, right? The idea that this is my private thing and I should own the land rather than being part of the land. And so these kinds of invisible consensuses are, when you think about the system thinking, it doesn't matter what you change. And I would argue that the reason that you could switch any, if you took a head of state from any country almost, and you switched it with the head of state from some other country, you'd have the same bozo. And it's because the water is running through everybody and it doesn't matter what system of government you have, and it doesn't matter what, you know, what else you do because the water is all poisoned. And so those are the systems that I've been working on. And I've been talking, I started from the area of democracy. I'm Israeli, I live in Slovenia. Um, and cause I'm trying to live somewhere livable. And, uh, and uh, yeah. And so I've been working on these ideas sort of since the Arab Spring. I was like, oh, well, it's really great to overthrow your dictatorship but you know, I have nothing to recommend. But I always keep coming back and I, 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 I keep coming back to the rivers or the mortar. It's like we have such a tendency to look at the bricks and not the mortar. And so that's what I'm trying to bring attention to and look at in my work. Because again, when you're talking about systems thinking, you're like, how does this one affect that one? It's like, yeah, but how does the air affect all of them? So that's me. That's my intro. Grace, thank you very much. That's super cool. Um, and triggered a lot of things in my head, which I'm going to try to avoid talking about right this second and see who else would like to jump in. There being, there being an appropriate pause. Wait, someone was speaking up. Uh, I'll, I, I was wanted Go to give it, it, yeah. pause appropriate length, but I want to jump in to say, Grace, thank you so much. This is one of the more refreshing things I've heard about this story in a long time. Uh, the rivers are the flows. Uh, you know, Della Meadows and others talk about stocks and flows, but you're talking about flows in a more um, <clears throat> deeper and more transcendent sense, and I love it. Thank you. Um, and Thanks, Vincent, Bill. question for you. I missed the beginning of your share. What's the overarching heading for your collection? Um, what, what, are you, what are you after? Um, a interoperable meta framework of categorization systems around social impact. Great, got it, thank you. <laughs> well, that, that, that works. That works. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more about the importance of the, the rivers and the flows and the connections between um, and the relationships <clears throat> and also the relationships that aren't there. Um, so yeah, how that gets visualized and labeled in, into the, you know, the territory, the map will be really, will be really interesting. Um, yeah, it, it was it was also cool kind of seeing how there was just like what I learned from from that that experience of doing the mapping was how there are different types of communities, like some that use SDG, some that use like the 12 sectors that like focus on like very on different things. And the way that they focus on them is also different. Like the 12 sectors has like whole systems design right in the center. The SDGs has the UN logo in the center. So mm -hmm. there's a, a bit of a different, um, right, like feel there just with the, the visual aspect of it um, versus having like a brand versus having a like a goal. Um, I'll stop there. Grace, the other thing about um, your comments on the sketch is that, you know, we, we, we're labeling the things and not the rivers, but all of that is living on a landscape, on a terrain, on a topography. And that's rarely talked about in any modeling exercise. It's sort of, you know, it's, it's the background that we're living in. It's the, it's the clearing that Heidegger talks about. Um, and it's hard to talk about it because it's invisible. And not, you know, and my friend Chauncey Bell says there are things that are not just unseen, but unseeable and yet are deeply important to us. So um, your comment evoked that for me as a missing element in just about every systems diagram mapping scheme I've ever seen. Um, Ken? Quickly, I just want to jump in and say, um, 
Jonathan Haidt wrote two books that well, he's written more than two, but the two that I'm aware of are The Happiness Hypothesis and uh, The Righteous Mind. And he was interviewed and he said, when I wrote The Happiness Hypothesis, I was convinced that happiness came from within. And when I researched and wrote The Righteous Mind, I became convinced that happiness comes from between. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I often, uh, working with collective intelligence and groups, I've discovered you cannot walk into a room and say, yo, collective intelligence, show yourself, because it doesn't exist until you create relationships. And so your point, Grace, about the flows in between, to me, is that figure ground reversal of by focusing on relationships, which is context, we get a very different understanding of the maps that we're looking at. So I just wanted to throw that out. And thank you, because Vincent and Grace both. I mean, just, this is really rich. I'm, I'm, I have to be like Jerry and sit on my hands now because I'm like, uh, all excited. <laughs> Thanks, Ken. Mark? Uh, one of my favorite uh, observations is that all models are wrong. They basically only take a subset of things, um, but they can be useful. That's it. Cool, a famous quote. Um, I did want to throw in a couple of things now that there's been a circle around sort of water uh, as a metaphor for things, uh, Grace built on what you were doing. Um, and also uh, going back to Vincent and his hand-drawn map, it's like, there have been many attempts to draw landscapes of knowledge. Uh, there's like the maps of the, the famous funny maps of the internet. Like here's, here's the land of Facebook and here's the gulf of what despair, you know, the bit bucket or whatever. Uh, and they're interesting, but they're all partial, which is I think partly why the instinct to layer on multiple maps and to see what the relationships between the maps are. And I think that intermapal communications or intermappery analysis is really, really interesting uh, and could yield a lot of, a lot of, of good stuff. Uh, but in terms of water, several different things. One is there's a thing called a sand key diagram, I'll, and I'll, I'll type these into the Mattermost chat. But sand key diagrams, basically, um, there was a guy named Sankey who tried to model the British economy using water. And so think of, you know, in, in inflows, uh, uses, and then outflows, and, and, and water preserves mass in some sense, but shows you the flows. And it was a nice it was a nice way of modeling an economy, for example. And I don't know how far they've gone, but there are now people who draw Sankey diagrams. It's one of, you know, there's a polar chart. There's a whole series of ways of, of modeling uh, dynamics and stuff like that. And this is a really interesting one. Totally separately, there's a guy named Victor Schauberger, who was an engineer helping get lumber <clears throat> off of hillsides, uh, I think in Sweden or Scandinavia someplace. And he was building flumes. Basically, uh, you put water in the flume and you get the logs off the hill by, by sluicing them downhill. But he started developing all these theories about water and what makes water alive and water kind of needing chaos and never loving a, a straight line. And there's a whole bunch of stuff about the dynamics of water. And then there, there's a couple other people about the nature, the weird nature of water and uh, you know how it contain, can contain emotions and all that. That's another, another thread. And then back to a piece of what you said about money, Grace. Uh, Arthur Brock has a really, really nice video about Bessie the cow and how money compacts value. And he unpacks different kinds of value that Bessie represents. Bessie was my favorite cow, something that's impossible to represent in money. Uh, Bessie was the best milk producer in the herd. Bessie, you know, Bessie this, Bessie that. But I'm really interested, very interested in the unpacking of value so that we aren't minimizing and constraining everything to the exchange of dollars. And as kind of the libertarian point of view seems to be that if only everything had a price and everything had a perfect market, we'd be fine because markets are the most efficient way to distribute resources, <clears throat> which to me is a bad fiction. Uh, they're good for some things and they're terrible at other things like commons, really, really bad at commons. Uh, so anyway, thought I'd uh, throw those things in the, in the conversation and uh, Vincent, you've checked in really nicely. And I think, uh, Tony, you, we were back to you to check in. And then, uh, sorry, we'll go. Uh, and Grace, was that your check-in? Cool. So then we'll go uh, Stacy Mark. So Tony, Stacy Mark. You, you, you talked about me, Jerry? I thought I... Uh, if you feel like that was your check-in, I think you sort of came in and so that'd be, that'd be fine. Oh, okay, I'll just briefly restate systems thinking. Somebody mentioned that systems thinking is not one thing, but as Derek Cabrera points out, it's not 2,842 things, and that's kind of the way things are currently. That cannot continue. He says that these, you know, students are saying, hey, I can't learn this stuff, and there's no job in doing it. And uh, Midgley's talking about it. unless we could come up with a unified uh, approach to systems thinking that hooks out into other things, one unified core that hooks out into other 
aspects of system thinking that unless we could do that, the whole career field is going to fall apart. So I think they're right. both spot on. A so system that's, that's what I'm systems on. thinking. It's a system <laughs> systems thinking map, perhaps. Um, so let's go, Stacy Mark Gill, and I, I will still be here. I just have to move uh, locations. So following off of Anthony, and thank you to Vincent and Grace. Um, one of the reasons I was excited in the um, chats that we were having, the emails when we started, to, when you guys started talking about videos, is because I saw that I saw the whole system of creating this, uh, of creating videos as a possible model for unified theory, and let's see if I get this right. I I wonder what would it look like if we were to replace money with attention and start thinking about how things might flow that way. Um, Grace, you look really confused, that face. <laughs> um, Jerry once asked, Jerry once said, what would it have been like if Facebook would have really tried to give back to the person who was set up differently? And that's something that I think of a lot because Facebook did give a lot of people something, not necessarily the people in this room, um, Neil Davidson talks about, yeah, I'm going on to another tangent right now because there is one thing that I wanted to state because it's usually not a lot of females in the room and I thought this was important. Neil had mentioned a whole sector of people that don't understand something. And it made me think of the difference between how parents get their kids to do something that's important. Uh, it seems that the male way is to scare people into doing something. You better do this or this is going to happen. Whereas when I think about mothers in really dangerous situations, but I'm talking about really dangerous more, they didn't tell their kids, if you talk, we're going to be killed. They made it into a game. They, they took away the fear. And I think that, I think that we really need to look at fear in any of these systems. And I know I'm all over the place, but so just to bring it back, as far as what Grace and Vincent were talking about, what I wonder is what if we shifted Vincent, that centerpiece, because I always see education, media, and entertainment all being the center hub as a way to create attention as currency and possibly be able to, I don't know, make things flow differently in a way that actually feeds people internally as well. I'm done because I know I know it's very abstract what I'm saying. So that's why I'd be better in a smaller group. <laughs> uh, this is, well, this is a slightly larger than a really small group. So we're, we're right at that boundary kind of. Um, thank you for that, Stacey. Uh, did somebody want to, uh, Mark, please. Um, Gil's gonna go next. Okay. And then I'll go after Gil. But Mark. Thibault has his hand raised. Yeah, that's that's the beauty of having two marks. Yeah, Mark, you right. want to say something first? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say something about fear. Mm. Uh, you, you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right, uh, Stacey. It's not something that we integrate so much into our processes, and yet they have a huge impact. The biggest that I see is on, on the kids today, how disconnected and, and, and depressed they are. I don't know if there is any study that I've measured how more depressed kids were are today compared to 40 or 50 years ago. But but just the very fact of when you're 12 or 13 years old and climate change start integ being integrated in, into the curriculum, that is huge. The impact is huge. It's as if we are telling them there is no future. How are these kids going to evolve in our society in 10, 20 years from now? We just, again, you know, doing things, hoping for a result <laughs> and going back to this beautiful definition of insanity. So I'm complete with that. Thanks, Mark. Gil, did you want to jump in? Um, uh, I, I think I'm up for check-in. So let me just say two comments and then offer that. Um, um, Scotland is actually integrating ecological restoration into their school curriculum. So it's a different model of what to put into the curriculum and what kind of vision to plant in young people's minds and a large part of their 
education is going to be outdoors. Kind of remarkable move. There's a lot very interesting going on in Scotland, including public banking and some other things. Um, um, <clears throat> Um, I really appreciate Vincent, Vincent's uh, meta mapping exercise. I geek out on that sort of thing a lot, uh, but I realize that I'm also intrigued uh, by the challenge of not only generating the most complete and comprehensive maps, but also the most essential, minimal and compact maps. Uh, and maybe this is Daoist systems thinking. I don't know what that is. Um, for me personally, um, life has taken a turn. We've got some real estate challenges to deal with courtesy of the city of Berkeley. Uh, so a lot of entrepreneurship efforts are going to crank down for a while, and um, I'm cranking up my effort to build out my speaking business as maybe a good flexible way to gather some coin while doing what I want to do. Um, <clears throat> most intriguing thing for me this week is uh, yesterday uh, had the next session of my monthly webinar on Living Between Worlds, and the focus was what I've come to call capital-ism. Um, you know, which tries to suggest the fe fetishization of financial capital in the world we're in. And I'm in an exploration about what I'm calling the structural defects of capitalism, not what we don't like about it, not what we think is unfair about it, not what we think is mean about it, but what's in the structure of things that reform efforts like shareholder capitalism and conscious capitalism and so forth don't really address. Um, and it was a very rich conversation. I thought from my perspective, the chat was more full than I've ever seen a chat, um, at least in one of my webinars, but maybe in any that I've seen. Um, and um, there's a missing piece that we're chewing on. I'd like to just drop it on you and see if people have suggestions maybe offline. Um, the, 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 the defects that I've identified are accumulation without limit, extraction without reciprocity, alienation without care, abstraction without ground, and privatization without something. And we don't know what that word is yet. We have stewardship as a placeholder, but that's not quite right. It's not parallel. Um, and so I'm open to suggestions there or discussions with anybody who's interested in this to get at the, essential, the essentiality of the thing. Uh, and privatization is a tough one because in the, you know, in the history, of the emergence of capitalism, we see violence, we see privatization con connected with violence from the enclosure acts um, to chattel slavery, if you will. And um, Becker, I forget his first name, has a fascinating book called The Empire of Cotton, uh, which charts the emergence of war capitalism as the nature of what we have lived in, what we have evolved as modern capitalism comes out of war uh, and colonialism. Uh, it's a fascinating and provocative book. Anyhow, uh, I'm happy to talk with anybody more about that. I'm open to suggestions about that missing word after the ellipsis. Fast work, Jerry. And Gil, this was not right now. This is from when you posted it online. I was uh, like, oh, okay. So I put it in and um, uh, my computer is just beach balling on me, which is too bad. But I'm going to go to critiques of cap. Oops, got to spell it right. You do. Uh, critiques of capitalism is, of course, a thought. And there's lots of stuff under critiques of capitalism. And then Empire of Cotton, I've got, and I can show you who the author was. But, uh, but anyway, this is what I do. And what I didn't do yet, for example, is I didn't connect extraction without reciprocity up into extractive industries and sort of there's other people who are saying a similar sort of thing to this, which is what I would, you know, what I would do given given more time. It, it, connects, uh, it connects to extractive industry. It also connects to um, braiding sweetgrass. Yes. Yeah. And here's Sven Beckert and uh, Empire and, of Cotton. Yeah. Uh, and then I will go, I will connect that to today's call because I've started, see, beach ball. Damn it. My computer's just doing too many things at one time. Uh, and then braiding sweetgrass, I'll connect in as well, just because I, I like to figure out. And apparently, we've mentioned uh, Empire of Cotton on several different calls because I. I do that. You have, uh, and if, all, and you have it, all content mapped out? Wow. Uh, yes, I, I use the brain for all these things. It's really, really, really helpful. And I'm thinking, uh, so here's got to spell it correctly also, rating sweetgrass, yep. indigenous, indigenous wisdom, scientific knowledge, and the teachings of plants. Uh, there we go. My 
computer's finally catching up. So Pete once on one of these calls was note taking in HackMD, but he shared his screen behind him using mm -hmm, which is one of many sort of virtual cams. And it was really nice because you could go pin Pete uh, and watch him do that in the background. You could also go to the document itself and cooperate with him, which is kind of cool. Uh, I'll just uh, stop sharing for a second so I can talk and uh, see you guys. Uh, and um, and I would love to sort of do the same thing with my brain, except my computer melts when I try to use uh, the virtual cam plus Zoom plus all this other kind of stuff. So kind of kind of stuck with uh, like throttled by the processor is a is a problem. But but I'm actively note taking during our calls as well as trying to moderate. Uh, and on this call in particular, because it's a little bit more chaotic than usual, because we're shifting how how the locus of control works and all of that, um, I'm finding that it's it's a it's like I'm stalled by stalled by technology. Doug, you wanted to jump in? Uh, yeah. Um, on the word private, uh, it has a very interesting origin. It comes from the Latin privatus, which means to remove from the public. And the feeling that goes along with privatising something uh, is sadness because it becomes a dead thing because it's lost its community connections. Mm. Will you? Uh, I find that. Would you also Sorry? share with? Would you also share with us the etymology of the word idiot? <laughs> um, I don't know. at the moment. Oh, sorry. The, 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 means the unique, unique. The, the idiotes is the the selfish person who takes things away for themselves. Uh huh. Okay. Um, so it's related. I, I I didn't I didn't mean to just stamp on what you were saying. I, it's totally related. Totally. Um, so, and, and, this is, have... and this is why the reciprocity and the alienation connect to the privatization. Yeah, and, and private in our world goes with property. Mm -hmm. And property has the very interesting de derivation that it comes from proper. Uh, it's what's proper to a man of rank to show his status in society. Uh, so it started as a social sign and became alienated, became a thing you could buy and sell. And um, this is, if I had more time, I would do this, but um, there are ancient concepts of reciprocity from lots of different communities. So uh, here's Aini, which comes from the Quechua and Aymara traditions, uh, along with, uh, so here's Quechua and Aymara concepts of community, Ailus, Munai, these are all terms. Uh, then you go to Utu, which is a concept from, Utu means reciprocity in, uh, the Maori language, uh, where they have a whole bunch of really interesting terms about stewardship and so forth. And I mean, most languages on earth will have a word for reciprocity. The thing is, these words that, that I'm focusing on here are central to the cosmology of these different indigenous, these different ancient, ancient cultures. Uh, there's the word methyl, which I'm probably mispronouncing, which is about reciprocity in farming in Ireland, I think in the sort of uh, Celtic uh, lands. Anyway, I'll uh, share back the screen. And Vincent, you wanted to jump in as well. Wait, Jerry, I had one more thing I wanted to say. Please, Doug. That? Yes. Uh, and it has to do with, if we look at Vincent's drawings of concepts connected by pipes, and it's now pointed out nicely by Grace that the pipes have a flow of something in them, which is water, which could be multiply defined. What's missing in that description is that the concepts and the pipes are in a landscape, which is unnamed. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that most attempts to do concept maps in a terrain, take the terrain as given and talk, look at the concepts changing and how we could develop a theory of landscapes, actually the tone of the culture, so to speak, uh, is a place we need to go. There's a, there's a conversation right behind this conversation, which is about ownership versus stewardship and landscapes themselves. Mm -hmm. And what used to happen all around the world was that most ancient tribes managed the landscape. They didn't divide the landscape into individual plots and say, that's your cornfield, this is where I raise my cows. And this is what the, the poem Mending Wall is actually sort of about uh, by Robert Frost, the famous poem, which I think it's misinterpreted a whole bunch. It's not about let's build more fences. It's, it's where the phrase good fences make good neighbors comes from, which is a, which he's saying, we don't really need this fence, this wall between us. Your cows won't eat my pine cones. Like we don't need this wall. Why are we sitting here maintaining it every season, right? And so, and so 
uh, if you went to Australia, North or South America, you'd discover that the locals had managed the landscape to live off it together because they understood very intelligently what they did with controlled burning, creating longstanding weirs, uh, herding bison into a canyon and then feeding off them for a season, all kinds of really interesting things they did in the whole landscape together. Uh, Mark, uh, Mark Thibault, and then Gil. Yes. So very interestingly about how the landscape is being used and shaped. Uh, we, we, we're seeing in the Amazon where there was a concentration of human beings, you'll find uh, a, a higher frequency of plant species. And then suddenly you have uh, a more less organized, or, or, or how could I say that, um, more diversity of plants. And that's usually would be the buffer zone separating one community or tribe from another one. So it's how they would be using that space. Um, it's, it talks to, to, to what you were saying, Jerry. So just want to share quickly something that I've been working on. And that is uh, on, on the right side, you have all the pressure on uh, indigenous people in the Amazon or indigenous people in general, actually. And mm -hmm. on the left, uh, what, what they are. So I would love to have this opportunity to go deeper in that with some of you, if ever uh, some you know, are interested. Um, all the benefits, like for instance, you know, we know now, and I think I mentioned that the last time, uh, that indigenous people have a much higher diversity of microbiome. So when we talk about biodiversity or diversity, it, it is shown in, in very different aspects. One of the other things that I've been working on is health and well-being from an indigenous perspective. And usually, you know, this is, this is a terrible uh, first take. Uh, at, at, at showing that, expressing that, because um, it's so holistic that they do not break it down into categories. However, uh, when I was thinking of uh, communicating that to, um, you know, more Western audience, it became evident that it had to be done this way. So the individual on one space, the spiritual aspect on the other space, the social and the environment. And if Anyone would love to play with this um, with me? I'd love to. Thank you. And that was also my check-in. Thank you, Mark. And it, it occurs to me that we should set up a separate call um, and do what Vincent proposed only sort of back into it. Go, go start from a different place and start from maybe the map you just showed about pressures on indigenous peoples. And then layer on top of that are different versions and improvements and layers of mapping and value around that and kind of <clears throat> back into uh, the, the directories and the catalogs and the force field analysis and other sorts of things around this issue. Uh, I think that could be a really interesting exploration for us. <clears throat> so um, maybe we find a time that works for a few people, uh, bring a few people who are actually like, who are in the middle of that issue of pressure against indigenous communities in as our, as our, uh, as our guests or clients for the call and then uh, Riff on that. I'd love to do that. I would love that. That'd be oh, great. Uh, <laughs> so we had Vincent, you wanted to jump in and Gil, you are, yeah. you need to check in before the top of the hour. So Vincent, then Gil. So yeah, I wanted to respond to Gil's initial question about um, what between privatization and steward, what's maybe the word that fits there. And it, it occurred to me while you guys were talking. Well, it does, Vincent, it doesn't need to fit between steward may not be the right word to Right, Con that's what I meant. Contrast. And, and Vincent, your 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 earphones may not be plugged into your laptop because you're we're hearing you from the laptop, not the ear, not the earphone mic. Right. Okay. You sound pretty pretty faint. So while we're at it, let's maybe fix that. Um. All right. I hope this is better. Um. Good. Sounds the same, but uh, we can hear you. It's just okay. that it's you're I'll, very faint. I'll just I'll just speak up. You're fine. So, Basically, what occurred to me is that the private sector, um, like in the economy, there's like everyone talks about public and private sector. Private sector doesn't have to be responsible to the public. And so I think it's, I think the word that I would put there is responsibility, but it's not just, res it's responsibility to who? I think it's responsibility to the public or the whole right so like if you own a piece of land like you are responsible for making sure that land is better 
after you leave it right so it's concept like that's i don't know if maybe stewardship is the is a better word than yeah responsibility but um that was what i wanted to add to gil's point mm -hmm. I, li I like it thank you thank you um uh, gil go ahead you're, you're well, just four. A, <clears throat> some comments and to finish the, the check-in um um Grace suggested that uh, the landscape or you know the clearing or the narrative is, is, is a property of mind, but I think it's not a pro of, of human individual human mind, but I think it's a property of mind as a as a, as a broader phenomenon Ca mind capital M or minds all of us in interaction because the narrative doesn't live in me. You know, I'm born into it. Uh, it's, it's there and invisible and you know I sometimes notice it. Um, I also commented before that we don't, you know, we don't explicitly map the landscape in our maps. And I didn't mean that as a suggestion. I'm not sure that it should be mapped or that it can be mapped, but we certainly need to be aware of, you know, the piece of paper that we're drawing the map on um, or the screen that we're constructing a map on, which, which already in itself changes the map that I will build. The different technology of mapping is going to affect how I map. Um, the other, other comment is um, the, Jerry, the Robert Frost poem reminded me about the misappropriation of, of people's creativity and of prophecy and so forth here in the case of Frost or Adam Smith, who wouldn't recognize uh, or probably like uh, what we do in his name these days. And you've talked about Pasteur and the, you know, and the organism and the terrain. Um, and just earlier in this conversation with the, the East India Corporation story, um, misappropriating the word anarchy, which, you know, means something very different in the mouth of uh, anybody from Proudhon to Noam Chomsky. Uh, and I think is something that lives in uh, the landscape of our conversations here. Um, you know, because uh, uh, we talk a lot about coordination without the hierarchy of domination. And that's um, one thing I think we're questing after here. Yeah, exactly. Love that. Um, and and um, uh, two cheers for anarchy by uh, Scott is one of is a really great book, and I agree with you entirely about anarchy. But it so happens that the anarchy is well titled because of the context uh, in India and so forth. And I just wanted to say I've got a thought in my brain: misused and misquoted, or misquoted and misused, uh, which is Indian giver, uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, my country right or wrong, survival of the fittest. Uh, these these terms are misused constantly. Um, and so I have a thought for that, which I will connect to today's uh, so call. Had, had one for anarchy as is chaos. Yeah. Um, and so I will pass the mic to Mark Carranza. You had your hand up a moment ago. Um, there are some thinkers that do include the um, paper in the diagram. Um, certainly uh, Charles Sanders Peirce, American um, uh, pragmatic philosopher, probably the best American philosopher ever, um, who's woefully unknown. Um, and uh, there are people, um, I can't bring off the top of my head, uh, but um, he wrote a book, Diagrammatology, um, which is an excellent but difficult book. Um, also takes uh, a look at the um, epistemological and ontological um, notions of the reality of mapping. Um, again, woo, woo, kind of over your head, um, uh, continental philosophy at times, but uh, if anybody's interested, it's out there. As I say, the truth is out there. Um, and I, you know, I totally lost and screwed up my old list. So I've got Ingrid, Scott, Bentley, Michael. Let's try that. Oh, hey, guys. So I've missed you the last few months. Um, uh, you know, um, I have a new job now, and I'm actually waiting to get off. I didn't even think I could stay this long. But what's interesting is I um, keep lurking on uh, seeing the emails going by. And there is a concept I've been working on since before the pandemic, um, which also involves systems thinking, um, tying things together, which are maybe not thought of in a holistic way and putting it together in an actual um, physical presence. So um, that 
would involve business, agriculture, art, and and um, and synthesizing them and having them amplify each other. So it's so interesting that I found you anyway randomly, and I've been lurking, and I keep seeing these nuggets coming out, and they're almost like they're telling me, "Yes, keep going. You are thinking about you know things that the rest of the world is also coming to a realization of." So I want to thank you for that. And when I saw Vincent with his diagram. Um, it also really relates to some of the things I'm thinking about with this actual physical place to put these things together to start having people work together. So I'm really um, enthusiastic about staying with the group. And even if I can't come, I will definitely be lurking on your uh, emails and, and very interested also in um, regenerative um, um, agriculture. So I saw some threads on that. Um, I think it's Ken, isn't it, who works in that, right? Uh, it's actually Klaus. Oh, Klaus, right. Yep. Um, so, um, you know, also I was wondering, are we going to, is it, or have I missed it, um, that we have sort of a book list? Because you guys always mention these things. And another thing is, I think, who has the time to read all this stuff? I'm so impressed because honestly, like I've got my 40 hours a week and then, you know, my other stuff. And um, I, 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 I would love to even do something that would be more of a, um, you know, what do they call it when you go to college and your uh, cliff notes kind of thing, right? Um, what are the nuggets? Because a lot of these writers are brilliant, but then you have to weed through a lot of, let's just be honest, crap to get the nuggets. So anyway, um, <laughs> no, okay, I'm throwing it out there. Anyway, so um, that's, that's Mark acting like a weed whacker right now. Just the weed, <laughs> the weed through the nuggets. Weed through the nuggets. Okay, perfect. Not I'm at so all. I hate to interrupt, <laughs> but actually, you there are so many things to notice in the context of reading and writing, and basically, yeah. it's great to possibly get back from the commentaries and go to the original notions. But boy, I do not. You know, I. I I make a joke about a reverse summarization engine where you put in the summary and the artificial intelligence spits out the book. <laughs> but, but really, gosh, people take incredible pains of craft at writing. And basically to, to summarize is like a model. It's not everything. Well, I, no, I, I have to agree. I mean, I'll, I, I'll back off now, I'm so. a writer as well. And I, I agree with you that you also have to look at the context and you have to go through all of that to get you to where you need to be to understand the concepts. But on the other hand, you know, I, 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 I hear these books and wow, amazing. But anyway, I, I agree. And then I, I need the other side too, but I'll leave it there because I might get called in, but um, just to know that I am still lurking around and I'm, we, I'm looking through all your stuff. Um, but anyway, thanks. Good to see all you guys again. Um, so I, I'm going to violate the protocol I started at the beginning of the call and just jump right in because I have a lot of things I'd love to offer you before you have to drop from the call. I'm thrilled that you've been lurking and, and are in this call. Thank you for everything you just told us. If you'd like to set up a, a channel on Mattermost to hold the thought and to put, to put the project you're working on in there so that we can know where to collaborate with you, I, we can help you do that. It's really easy to start a channel. Uh, so I, I'd love to do that. There's an OGM member named David Bauville who's been on a journey similar to what you just described. Basically, uh, he created a world table exercise at one point where people sat at a table shaped like the world, like a world map and then talked about issues and did stuff like that. He makes his art and technology. He's been sort of poking us to do stuff around COP26 in Glasgow uh, later this year. So there's a whole conversation there. Um, Buckminster Fuller famously did the world game. And we haven't talked much about the world game. Bucky's sort of a little bit in our conversation, not that much, but a friend of mine, Dwayne Hendricks, um, was at both world games. He was at the original world game, and then they did a, a recreation of it with modern technology. Because imagine you could do the world game where you actually had computers and projectors and could could like quickly do the data because it was all about like resources and and forces and all of that. Uh, then. Uh, uh, there's a thing called Five Minute Universities, which is how to distill the nuggets out of the, bo the books we read to know which books to go read. And Mark, what you said really rang a bell that I hadn't connected yet because I want more people to do Five Minute Universities on the books they love, on the things they care about. But then this guy, Dave Snowden, who's like the originator of K the Kinevin framework and a bunch of other stuff. Oh, shoot, Mike Michael, you've got to go. I'm sorry. And it is nine. 
Um, I'll finish with, with uh, Snowden and then go back to the floor. Oh, bummer. Um, and so Snowden basically uh, has a, a very deep riff on how whenever you put summarization, intermediation, reinterpretation uh, between raw data and anybody who has to make a decision, you screw up the system. Like he, he's, and he's really compelling on this. So he tries to create really powerful, he tries to create really powerful data collection tools. And he has a thing called SenseMaker, which is a triangle. It's really easy for humans to put their finger in a triangle between three different axes or questions, and it's a very data rich collection mechanism. And then he has a whole lot of other stuff that I don't know about how decision makers should tackle that data. But, but he hates summarization because usually, um, usually we miss the actual point that was made or we misinterpret the data or whatever. So, so some way of going from shiny nugget back to the original text and reversing the path seems incredibly useful to me because there's no way I'm going to make it through all the books in my Kindle queue right now. There is just like, my life isn't going to be long enough unless somebody cracks life extension soon. My life won't be long enough to read all those books and I need to know where to guide my attention, right? Uh, and then and then some like when you read the original, you're like, well, how the hell did this person over there come up with that interpretation of this work even at all, right? There's a, there's a, one of my favorite books is The Great Transformation by Polanyi. Uh, the head of the Mises Society wrote a letter to his followers saying, and the letter basically says, don't ever read this book. He's a terrible person. He's trying to do all these things. And the letter commits all of the sins that accuses Polanyi of committing, none of which Polanyi is committing. It's really, really interesting. The letter is simply a way of telling his followers not to read the book. And if you go and read the book, the book calmly states a bunch of stuff. It's like, wow, crap, we did that. So anyway, I love the quest you're on. I would love to be of service to it in ways that OGM might be able to be. Uh, let's set up a, a channel on Mattermost for it. Uh, and if you want to just reflect back before you have to bounce, uh, happy to hear what you what you think. Yeah, thank you guys. All cool. I, I have to pop off. But uh, yeah, I, I've just been secret about it because it's hard to present in a group of people I don't know, to be honest. And I, but I'm so fascinated by everything and it's, yeah, I keep getting these messages. So, but thank you so much, Jerry. And I'll see you guys uh, next time, hopefully. <laughs> thank you, Ingrid. Awesome. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, and now I've lost my cue and Michael, I'm so bummed Michael had to drop off. Uh, we had Ingrid, Scott, Bentley, Mike. Uh, Ingrid, so Scott Bentley, and then whoever hasn't uh, gone yet. Uh, Mark Kronza. So Scott. Hey everyone, um, what to say? Uh, it's been months and months since I've been here. Uh, I've been busy with freelance work. I'm also a new, newly certified trainer in systems thinking from Cabrera Research Lab, which has been really interesting for me. Um, in answer to, I can't remember who, I think it was Anthony's comment about unifying systems thinking. The work that Derek Cabrera has done is his fundamental thing was he noticed that all the previous work was on systems. So what are systems? How do systems work? And what he realized is that it's all from a human perspective because we're all thinking about it. So systems thinking, it's about the thinking. We've, we haven't talked about the thinking. We've been talking about the systems. So now he brought thinking into it and spent 20 years figuring out what thinking is. And that's kind of the work that, that he had done. And the idea about the 5,000 models of systems thinking, well, that's all stacked onto thinking. So systems is a modifier for the word thinking as like design thinking, creative thinking, empathetic thinking. So his focus was on thinking. And I think he nailed it. Um, one of my first comments to him was that I've been trying to break it. And he said, I've been trying to break it for 20 years and I can't, I can't break the, the four pieces that I've come up with down into anything smaller. I can't take any of them out or it doesn't work anymore. So anyway, I, I think that's kind of fascinating, but my angle from it with which the people of you who do know me, I'm interested in teaching it from people who don't know, have never even heard of any of this stuff. Um, my interest is in kids and in people who are like, I don't have time for systems thinking. Well, no, no, that's like woo woo. That's already too, too much for them. So what I'm working on is 
um, systems thinking, my, my uh, card deck, um, uh, books for young children in systems thinking, um, explanatory visuals and graphics, always one page, always one graphic uh, whenever I can, and continuing to build 30 to 45 minute lunch and learns on single parts, such as here's the four simple patterns of every thought, Here's a simple systems mapping language and, and codex for how to do that, which I would like to see as ubiquitous as outlining. And everybody just knows how to do this um, because it's not, it's not complicated. And then using objects and environments to help you think. So I come at it from the very simple, how do I get Lego pieces into the world and help everyone understand how to put them together and then I don't care what they do with it. Go, you know, go in every direction, please. But if you try to take all of the different directions and come back down to, well, what's at the root of all that? That's the part that I think that, I think he's found it. And every time I use it, it's simpler than you think in the sense that a, you know, little binder clip is simpler than you think. But how can you use it? And by it, we by, touch that. by it, do you mean the DSRP part in yes. the middle? Okay. Yeah. So just to, is that worth it's saying worth, for it, a minute? You know what? It's, it's worth uh, teaching us a bit. This is like a shiny nugget in the middle of what you found. And it's really useful for us to hear. Okay. So here's the quick summary. And I put a link to it in the chat. I put a link to okay. DSRP in my brain. Go ahead. Um, and maybe sometime I'll give you my 15 minute built from the ground up new slideshow that I just delivered to, to a bunch of people. Um, so DSRP stands for distinctions, systems, relationships, and perspectives. So what is a distinction? Distinction is an identity and an other. As soon as you decide what something is, you've created a boundary between it and everything else. We cannot think about anything unless we, we, we define what it is. And then we can talk about that boundary and make it bigger, make it smaller, make it more specific, make it broader. But we have to start with what is it? And that implies what it isn't. Second thing, systems of nested parts and holes. Everything is a part of something else and everything is a whole that contains parts. I mean, we're still finding things bigger than we ever thought and things smaller than we ever thought. So fundamentally, everything can be grouped into parts and holes. And to Vincent's point, it's interesting how you can take the parts and combine them into different holes, which is, that's, you know, that's what those frameworks and models are. Um, and the parts aren't changing, it's just how you're rearranging them. So be careful when we make a group of parts that we don't think that's the only way to group them. So we have distinctions, boundary between what things are and what they aren't, systems of nested parts and holes, relationships. So we have things that happen between those parts and holes. I think Grace was identifying that with the rivers. That's, that's all relationships. There's cause, effect. Um, there's action and reaction. It, it's all the things that are happening between those distinct items within the parts, between the holes. And then the last one is perspectives. So anything can be a perspective, can be the point from which you look or the thing you are looking at. And so by changing those around, anytime you change the thing that's doing the looking or the thing you are looking at, you change the distinctions, the parts, the holes, and the relationships. And so fundamentally, those are the four um, as far as has been discovered, those are the four indivisible patterns of every thought. And they seem to map to reality as well, in that every object is a part of a whole that has parts, that is in relationship to other things, that is distinct, has a boundary between it and everything else, and can be seen as the point of view, the point or the view. And um, I think what's so remarkable to me about this 
is that you can debate until the end of time about how that builds into everything. But it does. And, and it doesn't matter as much what it builds into because that's the joy of it. That's the perspective of everyone and everything and how we've all assembled these in different ways. So that's, that's my uh, summary of that. Scott, that was super useful. That was a really nice example of a five minute university, although I don't think you ran five minutes. Um, and it occurs to me that we maybe ought to set up every couple of weeks uh, an OGM call for five minute universities where we just make a queue of things exactly like what you just explained, a bunch of different ones, and then we slice those up and publish those separately uh, and put them in our, in our generative commons, the thing we're trying to build together uh, that has these ideas. I think that'd be really useful uh, broadly, you know. Um, cool. So we have uh, Bentley and Mark. Hey, everyone. And Doug, um, I think, too. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you may have noticed I had a cheat sheet up. I was thinking of one of the um, potential formats for this call is kind of the, the parking lot or something uh, where, you know, as people are, are sharing, they can, you know, say, I'd like to have this and discuss it um, after the group of um, things. And then people can break out now. You don't want those breakouts all happening at the same time because that's one of the challenging things that you want to attend multiple ones. But uh, that was just a thought. Uh, and then someone could be taking it down. And um, I'm sure there's more than I captured here. And then, of course, Vincent um, went ahead and started making one of these breakouts through the chat channel. So that should that could be fine, but I find it useful to have one place where we're storing the order of the updates. So uh, Jerry's kind of having to put them in the chat and losing them or whoever is hosting. And then this other thing about kind of breakout topics. So maybe finding a way to store these things um, outside of the chat or duplicate it in the chat. Or it's just a thought to make the calls go. Um, it just uh, something to think about for the calls. And then so, Anthony, Anthony, something I've been thinking about the um, universal, I'm sorry, now I've forgotten the term you were using, uh, unified theory. Um, when I hear unified, I feel, uh, I have the feeling that you're trying to take everything. And I'm thinking that there might be some, some things of system theory that may, should be in, excluded or left to advanced users. And so I'd almost like to think of another way to phrase that. I could be wrong, your intent may be, I am gonna include everything and it has to include everything or it won't work, but um, that's what I bump against. I haven't figured out how to type that in. So I, I didn't share that in the channel, but just some food for thought and we don't need to talk about it now. We can talk more in the channel, but, um, but I am interested in that. And then, uh, uh, Vincent loved your map. I thought maybe it'd be a fun little hour project to throw that on a website where people can toggle on and off the, um, the different layers. layers. Um, I could probably do that in a few hours. Um, and I don't think there's a no code tool for that, or I'd say go do that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that might be a fun little project that, you know, could post on my blog as showing what I can do. And then, you know, you can share your ideas. Uh, and I don't know if we could put that into our, I don't think we, yeah, I don't know if we could put that in um, massive, whether it can handle that type of dynamic content, but that'd be an interesting experiment. How do we, how do we expose that through our massive wiki? Um, and then one of the things I was working on is a quick editor or Pete suggests maybe just a quick commenting system in massive wiki. So, um, um, it made it, it won't even display because it's just for someone to say, Hey, I want to change this web page or make a suggestion. How do I do this? Um, so we're going to see if there's a, another like quick win where a couple hours worth of work would just take us one step closer to something useful. Um, anyway, so yeah, that that's what's been going on in my brain. <laughs> um, Bentley, that's, that's a lot of good stuff. Um, I'm going to resist the urge to jump in immediately and say, would anybody else like to comment on what Bentley just put in the room? 
There being nobody, I will jump in. Um, uh, just a quick note on uh, go ahead, Tony. Applied theory. I mean, it's a matter of degree. Not every not everything is going to fit into one, but the main concepts do fit together. What's missing now is there's there's absolutely no tie-in with anything. Goals and causalities are two different worlds, and they was, it's an excellent example of two things that absolutely need to be brought to be brought together. Because uh, causality, where we define the problem in detail, goals is where we need to first streamline the operations and have some common sense of what's going on around here without mapping out goals and negotiating a standardization about what they are or some agreement of what the goals are. You can't proceed. It's ridiculous to try to do a, a causal loop diagram. It's, it, it's going to be all wrong. And then and we need to do a five minute university on systems thinking. Mm -hmm. well, that's, 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 that'd be a good start. Thanks, Tony. Uh, so, um, Doug, is this a comment on what Bentley was just saying? Please go ahead. Uh, sort of. Uh, I'm concerned. It, it, this is a meta comment. I'm concerned that our concern for concepts and getting them right as a toolkit never gets to the issues that need to be discussed. And if you take a question like, what do we do about the oil companies and climate change? It's not at all clear to me what the concept world uh, brings to that question. That question is a narrative question and it's not so conceptual. So let me, let me jump in with what I was gonna comment on Bentley's check-in because it sort of ties back to what you just said, Doug, and maybe it's about how we organize OGM and, and its efforts. <clears throat> and, and I'll start with something different. I, I make notes to myself in the chat. So first, um, Phil and I were brainstorming how to, how to experiment with these calls, the Thursday calls. One of the ideas was let's have a different host uh, you know, on, on alternating weeks or something like that. Another idea was to split the 90 minutes in half and do 45 minutes as plenary uh, and then have a place somewhere on Massive or somewhere where people can say, I would love to check in, you know, basically have a queue of people volunteering to check in for that 45 minutes and then do breakouts for 45 minutes and have a similar place, maybe the same page in the dashboard that's like, what are our breakout topics this week? And that, you know, that, that way that we'll, we know that there's a bunch of people interested in these couple kinds of issues. And it, that sounds like a very reasonable experiment. I think we should sort of try that because then, then we can all speak more and go deeper in, you know, uh, in the breakouts. Um, I love plenary because I want everybody to sort of hear and see everybody doing stuff. I just really love keeping people in plenary, but it's very inefficient for trying to get stuff done. Uh, then uh, second thing is, my own mental image about all this stuff, systems thinking and all the different projects is that it's sort of like the world is a big hologram. Everything is deeply intertwined. I believe that. And that every now and then there are these little crystallizing moments where ideas get simpler, ideas congeal and, and, and line up in a way that's eas more easily communicated or some idea uh, runs rampant across the world and takes over and sort of freezes out a bunch of parts of the hologram or something like that. But, um, but that, a piece of OGM's work is helping crystallize the hologram, if that's not too weird language to put around it. But by weaving connections across layers of map or different kinds of map and mapping, by making different tools work together, by helping unify databases and analyses, I think we help people sort of bridge those gaps and make connections and use better tools to look at you know, the problems that we're facing in the world. And then, um, and then Doug, I, th I think that we need to figure out how to take all this like primordial goo of stuff that we're working on and make it practical and go try to influence uh, legislators and go be helpful to the sunrise movement and go, go put things in front of people who can use them so that we're not just sort of behind the curtain talking to ourselves about, about interesting models. So I, I, I like that. What I'm interpreting as a piece of what you were uh, saying is like, we actually sort of need to get busy and, and use these things in the world. Uh, and the more we step away from that, the more we're wasting our time in some sense. But, but my general approach towards solving these things is work everywhere at once, is that it, it's a hologram and you've got to tip the system in lots of different places. So if somebody is passionate about organizing systems thinking and connecting it and connecting up the various models of systems thinking, well, let's, let's find a place to nurture that conversation. And then let's figure out how to click that into the people building tools, the people uh, creating policy papers, the people uh, making movements, all that other kind of thing. Uh, Gil? Uh, you're muted. Um, 
I, I appreciate, Doug, what you're asking for, um, that, you know, that, this, that there are systems doing as well as systems thinking. Uh, but OGM may not be the place to organize legislative campaigns, maybe the place that, in, that increases the capacity and effectiveness of the folks who are running the campaigns to do those things. Totally so, we're, agree. so we're involved in everything, but we're not involved in everything. That there's a major OGM work principle, which is like, don't reinvent the wheel. So if anybody is doing something better than us or has already worked at work on it, let's let's help them achieve their goals. Like, like let's let's put little rockets on their ankles so that they actually achieve what they're trying to do. And not the dysfunctional ones, but the high functioning ones that are aiming toward the kinds of goals we're looking for. But but let's not replicate anything. Let's find people who are doing it and help them. Doug, did that uh, did that was I picking up generally where you're heading or was I misinterpreting? Well, I, I do feel misinterpreted here because uh, I'm not asking to go to pr practical activity. I'm asking to, I think the questions of uh, what to do about uh, climate change are, require a lot of deep reflection about society, politics, power, and stuff like that. It's not a Go, let's go to the practitioners and help them do what they're doing. I think we need clarity about the issues. Uh, and I think that clarity about the issues is not furthered very much by the concern for concepts. Mm -hmm. And let me respond to that. I think that that's absolutely true. Um, and that's an excellent point. Um, I just would want to clarify that. At the same time, like Jerry was saying, we're doing all at once. We're working on our tools for concepts, but we recognize that that's only one piece of the puzzle. And all the other stuff that you mentioned is very important and it probably is more important and should be done in an order. And we probably need kind of a meta discussion of saying, you know, how do we choose what tools to use when? Um, but uh, when we're suggesting these, like these minute little tools, we're not saying that these are end all be all or the, this is the main way to do anything it's just an additional something in the bat belt is that what they call the belt what Golden batman the, calls the belt the the bat belt the bat some, it's anyway. everything's a bat the something utility, utility belt. belt utility belt thank you i knew it was wrong anyways yeah yeah but that's a really good point doug we don't want to get over emphasis on building the tools or this little minute thing or even conceptualizing um, and step back to um, what you brought up. Anybody else want uh, on the question Doug has just raised? Uh, Vincent, please. Yeah, so thanks for raising the question, Doug. Uh, I think it's always helpful to like reevaluate your frame and how much you're getting into the weeds in terms of like actually getting to the end goal. Um, and so, yeah, for me, I, I would also, add on to what Bentley said that um, having the right like understanding of the, the territory and the right categorization systems um, from a perspective of someone who's building a tool is a really helpful endeavor to be able to connect people to action, to catalyze action. And so one of the things that um, on Friday, um, we have like an open house session. Um, I just posted a link to the event. Uh, designing the kind of like opportunity data type. Um, so like there's a lot of systems that do like needs and offers matching. And there's also like, um, I'm thinking of opportunity as like the main way to connect people with action. So an opportunity could be like, hey, I'm looking for help with this setting up this petition or I need uh, a co-founder to work on this project. Um, and the opportunities are like time sensitive and actionable. And those are the hardest things to organize because they change very rapidly and it's hard to do matching. And so that's why it's kind of been the last thing that we've designed. Um, but yeah, so how I'm seeing is like basically projects, communities and individuals could all have opportunities that are both personal and also aligned with the collective goals. And how do we make uh, a way to be able to court, use the internet and the digital tools we have to coordinate those opportunities across platforms to be able to like amplify our voices in a way that's not just spamming your opinion on a Facebook feed, but actually sharing something that people can take action over. And so that's kind of my frame has always been towards catalyzing action, but the, the how to do that has been like, categorizing information in a way that you can actually do that 
matchmaking almost automatically. Thanks, Vincent. Uh, Grace? Yeah, so this is my first time here, so I don't know, but it seemed there was some level of enthusiasm about the comment that, um, you know, that talking about the models doesn't, uh, or talking about, yeah, talking about the models doesn't implement the models, and that there's a, you know, like a bias towards talking, and this has been one of the, there's a quite a number of groups that I've been in that have been like that, but I haven't been in them for very long, just to warn you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Because because we need to do experimentation, and I think that the problems are quite obvious. I don't think we need to spend a lot of time defining them. And I, and also this search for unity and you know having the right model or having the right mission statement. I, I don't have any patience for that either. I'm like you know people are dying and stuff. Let's just try to prevent a little bit of that. That'd be good, you know. And and so. I think as any organization, and 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 also my distaste for um, mission statements comes from my religion, which I've know I, I know has survived for for a long time against all odds, and um, and the mission statement it's just like uh, I'm the one and only God, and you shall have no other gods before me, which isn't it's not much of a mission statement, um, and so that's why I kind of had distaste for mission statements. Um, but we've got laws and we've got narratives and we've got tools and we know how to measure what's right and wrong. And, and I, I feel like measures and outcomes, and I think Vincent was sort of pointing at that, right? Like knowing that we've actually caused people to be, you know, created something where people can take action. And then the next thing is seeing that they did take action and then seeing whether the action is moving in the right direction. And, and I mean, that's really where, um, my interest is right now. And it's not that I don't sit around and create models. I think we, we need to keep doing that, but, and adjusting them, but sort of as a function, and, and it's like, there's a play, right? I do something and then I get a new model and I test something and then I get new information. So, yeah. Thanks, Grace. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have to wrap the call at the half, unfortunately, which is coming up quickly. Uh, a couple really quick things. Um, one is, I think, I think there are multiple maps on the territory that serve different purposes, work for different people. I don't know about the one map that rules them all. I think, and I'm suspicious of the one map that rules them all because once you've defined what the map is, what everybody in power does is they co-opt the terms in the map, they dilute them, they attack them. They, like, as soon as you say, this is the, this is the best framework or this is what it is. Then Doug, I, I'm one of way too many conversations I'm in is a bunch of scientists that, who went to, to SciFu camp, the Google Science Foo camp. And there was a sub conversation about the carbon sequestration effectiveness of old growth forests. And surprisingly, uh, a bunch of really smart people way beyond my pay grade were like, you know what? Uh, old trees are not sucking down a lot of carbon. That's not their job in the world. And you know, they were sort of raising an eyebrow about, hey, let's just go like say about the, the, and there's a difference between new growth trees and whatever, but there was this really complex and nuanced argument merely about planting trees and plants for carbon sequestration. And I'm like, I don't, and, and that's this week, now in this world, which is in crisis. And I'm like, I don't know that we get to crystallizing and understanding um, the whole picture before we go out and act on it properly. And in the interest of doing everything at once and acting everywhere at once, I'm thrilled about trying to crystallize the hologram, but I also need to get out and do something immediately. So I have this sense of urgency to just go out and help people who need help, change people who have power, who have their hands on the levers, all of that kind of stuff with the best interpretation at hand today of that crystal vision. Um, and, and we haven't done a great job in OGM of using our tools to share the vision and to crystallize it and to improve it. And several of us have put major works into the community to like, hey, here's my vision of what's going on. And we haven't spent the time to sort of deconstruct them and work on them and figure out how to do. Um, so anyway, I, <laughs> that's great. Um, so unfortunately we need to wrap the call, but um, Mark Ronza, go ahead. Very tiny thing, go. In the CSC Agora, I started a quest called Tracking Collaborative Dynamics. Um, please uh, contribute. Sounds great. Would you put the link in our in the in the Mattermost chat that we're also trying to use for this? And we, uh, I already was really done. already done. Brilliant. You're you're awesome. Thank you. 
Um, I, I got really strewn by this call, but I love this call. And for me, like we were on two different chats and I couldn't keep track of both. Control of the call was moving all over the place and that was kind of funky. But I uh, thank you all for being here very much. This has been like generative and uh, fun and uh, uh, we'll do this again next week and maybe in a different, a slightly different format. Thanks all. Thanks guys. Good to see you all. Take care. I wonder if this could stay on. I'd love to talk with Vincent and Scott. I'm not sure uh, how. Uh, oh, it's also recording. So stopping the recording would be. <laughs> it it kind does of work, but but the recording stays on. And I don't know, since we're the last three people, if we're able to turn that off. Who knows? I'm basically who cares? I'm not going to talk about anything. Yeah. Um, I, have to, I have to run in. A, I have to run in a few. I could say um, a few minutes. Not a problem. You're where at Stanford? Are you at Stanford? You said. Uh, myself? Yeah. I, I just, I, I couldn't I a, hear what you said. Oh, no, no. Um, I, so I live in Long Island. I did a fellowship program with Stanford with the D school um, called University Innovation Fellows. Um, and I went to RPI. Yes. Yes. I, I, I already know that. Vince, I'd love to talk and, and Zoom with you. A good time uh, um, uh, would be difficult i'm working at the internet archive just kind of restarted uh, the work and boy disability is about more than just missing work it's about missing lots of parts of life so trying to catch up um and uh yeah there's lots to talk about i think um yeah so uh repeated uh request to uh um you know give me a good time um, maybe next um next wednesday tuesday or wednesday sometime. okay great um if you want i could send you if you want to book a time on my calendar those two days are pretty open if you want to pick a slide it'll generate a, a meeting link for us um please do you have my uh um how do you say uh email first name dot last name at gmail vincent dot l dot arena at gmail oh uh, no uh, my uh, what's okay. yours mark dot at... at gmail okay and uh, I need to save this chat again. Boom, save chat. Um, thanks, and, and Scott, um, uh, hi. I'm an artist, um, scientist, epistemologist, and software developer. I work at the Internet Archive, and uh, for 37 years I've been writing down uh, the thoughts that I curated uh, with the intent of seeing those thoughts again. So I've got, 2.7 million thoughts and 14 million links in between them so um kind of a big i i don't like the term mind map i like kind of asynchronous mind mirror um and kind second of like, brain is a term that's been uh, gaining some traction yeah it's yeah, been, yeah. it's been co-opted by uh what's his name um, yeah for you yeah. know I get a, lot it. Of, a lot of commercialism that you know it's good that he makes a living. Um, uh, but I, I think second is, so I wanted to point out the uh, Charles Sanders purses, uh, minimum viable, on, viable ontology of firstness, secondness, thirdness, where he says that any fourthness is basically a combination of, uh, you know, the firstness or the secondness and the thirdness, um, that type of thing. Not to put down the uh, Cabrera, I really am into interested in looking at that mm -hmm. um but uh also um uh just as a contrast i've been looking at a lot of fourfold um traditional analysis systems across um cultures and across centuries um from aristotle to leibniz to um uh let's see what's his name uh ernst mock um german um uh victorian um and yeah, totally interested in that kind of stuff. Yeah, the, the fundamental principle as I understand it, and I'm no expert, um, I've discovered it about a year ago and then have produced visuals about my own understanding, which is what I do to help myself uh, kind of gel the concepts, make them, keep them top of mind. Make Because if I can explain it visually, then I, I feel like I get it. 
And if I can't, then I'm not there yet. And so I, I make a lot of things to, to try to catalyze my own learning. I shared them with, well, I, I share them with the people, whoever I, I make them for and around. They resonated. Um, they said that I had captured some things or expressed some things that they hadn't been able to express in the same way before. And I thought, okay, well, I'm, I'm on to something. And so over the last year, I've I've pursued this a bit. But um, the 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 thing that I find most interesting about their research is that it it comes from a very scientific standpoint in the sense that he's just a no no BS kind of guy. He's like, if it doesn't work, I'm not using it. And, and he's just extremely practical and open to, to poking at it. Um, he, he really, he, he, he truly welcomes that. Whereas I, I've seen some people with their own mental models because it's their mental model, they, they, they have their own personality invested in it. And, you know, I, I think that this is, what, what I've experienced with my time with him, my, my certification was a month long, long thing. So, you know, we spent, we spent a significant amount of time together and I've communicated on the side. And, and what I've just noticed is that he's authentic. He truly believes this is true. He is working very hard to break it and to explain it. Um, he and his wife, who's also a PhD um, at Cornell, spent 10 years in elementary schools teaching it to kids to see if it really was as simple, universal, fundamental as, as they thought. And one of the things I heard was that if you can use this to make anything else, that's a sign that it's, it's at the root or close to the root. And he said, I haven't been able to find anything else that can make, make this. And so it, it seems to be working. And so um, he's had detractors, a guy named Gerald Midgley, um, who is a, a, a well-known systems thinker, I guess. You know, again, I'm new to the field. And he said, uh, no, this is it's just your model. And now here we are, oh, wow, a couple of years later, maybe. And Midgley has now asked them to write this is that chapter for his book because he's he's come around. He said, I think you're right. I, I think this actually might be, you know, true in, in whatever sense that that is. But it, it's anyway, so so if I can respond, okay. I study with uh, Terry Deacon of UC Berkeley, who is a physical anthropologist. Mm -hmm. Anthropology is the study of the human and physically is like what atoms, physics. Um, hemispheres, does that count too? Sorry? Hemispheres, the hemispheric, the, the oh, like the nature right of the brain, body. Right yeah. brain, left brain, rather than the continents of the earth, like the Northern hemisphere, Southern hemisphere. Um, no, I'm, I'm saying physically. So you're talking about anthropo physical anthropology. Are you talking about the, the makeup of the physical structure? Yes, as well as basically geographical or environmental. Well, you know, what, um, what special conditions, i.e. Um, the formation of the earth, um, the origin of life um, yeah. basically led to... Um, the ability to communicate yeah. and looking at communication as real part of what we do is yeah. basically try to physicalize semiotics yeah. um so basically we should be able to have communication as a scientific discipline um yeah i agree with that the things that come with that normativity uh how we value things um yeah. and basically even how we feel yeah um, so I, yeah, I, don't I, I know fundamentally that. believe it. And I think we get hung up on the idea that if you somehow standardize that, that you've limited everyone. And I, I say no, because, because when you stack any individual on top of that, it, it diverges rapidly. I was at a Catholic um, uh, mass where the sermon was about how 
basically you know describing the universe limits our concepts of that and i'm going like no come on <laughs> that's not it's not yeah. how it works but it works for some people you yeah. know there's, there's yeah, but, different ways of interpreting yeah my, my whole thing between you know science and religion was that well religion exists in the scientific world you know it's all like it's all part of the world it's all it, it exists you cannot deny that that those concepts and models exist because there are, there are billions of people who who practice that and so it's like okay well you can you can write it off as something but you have to write it off as something it, it is it is a thing and so you know i don't understand why there's such a well it's, it it doesn't exist i was like well yeah it does it exists what is it that's a question for the ages but but you can't deny that it, it it doesn't exist because it does exist there's also a uh, conundrum with uh basically the notion of illusion illusion like reality is an illusion well um yes yeah, so we basically exist in a mind that uh what is it uh hallucinates um to predict what its inputs are um going to be and compare them with its predictions um well, from it's, it's our mental model sure. well we can't we cannot well you know the one of my favorite things i think you'll enjoy this was the idea of our reality is bounded in our physicality and and an interesting way of saying that is we can perceive about a tenth of a second a little bit less to a couple of years maybe beyond that you know it's too complex to predict beyond a couple of years right and and shorter than that and we can't perceive it without other tools and another interesting we can predict for example the return of the comet ha haley yes um, but yeah, okay uh, all right I yes you understand i do understand okay. when you get to biological systems um uh you know i, yeah. I kind of we study emergent um, levels of emergence. And so keep going. Yeah. And well, and, and all right. Um, oh, I know. And so the other one is that we can see a walkable distance. We can't see further than we could actually travel. Now, for, there are ways of perceiving beyond the, our, our, our eyes. But generally speaking, it so it's it's just interesting to me that that we don't really consider the physicality that we all share. We all have these. We're all bounded by by similar things, and that's. Are you familiar with the concept of umwelt? Nope. That's a very important one. Um, U M W E L T. Yeah, the world as it is experienced by a particular organism. Okay. So bees have a different umwelt than than dogs, which have a different yeah. umwelt than people. Yeah. And there's Lebenswelt. There's there's basically a, a, a number of very um, powerful concepts that um, you know we have uh, we have limits, and we have uh, yeah um, different sensory availabilities which expand through science as you said yes. with with our instruments i had heard another way of describing it which i'm i'm fascinated with using physical objects to aid thinking i just i mean this is my project management tool it's a series of index cards um i've even published how to make this you Here know is my second brain yeah exactly and i'm not i'm not wedded to the second brain language i just brought that up yeah it's um, it's uh it's problematic for me right. <laughs> because well, it's not a brain a brain is something that grows from a tiny speck and differentiates into yes. this massive kind of thing it's not a designed system that we can basically specify it's something organic that grows it's mm -hmm. just the wrong mapping of foundational knowledge of something that's wet into something that's 
dry and it's just losing so much it's just so frightening anyway please so so one another way to think about our natural boundaries if you will for for lack of a better word is when we look around a space we see things we can grab because our scale we notice things at at like plus two factor minus two factor from human scale the notion of affordances as applied by don norman into uh the notion of what is it uh what we can design with yeah yeah, yeah absolutely and it's really interesting you don't see a spark plug surrounded by a car you see a car well, why? Because that's that fits with with this shape, you know, and and it's just interesting. And as we developed our conceptual abilities, as we as we uh, what you talked about um, umwelt, um, which I'm assuming is a welt. Yes. Ooh, nice. nice. I'm German. German totally, ancestry. So totally, totally re recommend. And I think it's exceedingly important to bring that concept into not only, you know, our mutual vocabulary, but the vocabulary of, of school children. Yeah. It's an incredibly important concept. Sure. So when we look at the, the work of the Cabreras, that is, that is P, that is perspective. And, and understanding that brings with it emotional intelligence and all kinds of, of good things. But what's interesting about their definition of perspective is you can also have perspective of inanimate objects. And so that that or ideas. What is the perspective? What from the perspective of the US government, what is X? You know, and, and it's it's just an interesting thing because Umfeld is talking about organism. And I wonder that seems to be living things. Is, is Umwelt seems originally, to be but you can expand it to yeah. basically what are the sensory capacity capacities of a sensory swarm system connected to the UC Berkeley, you know, mainframe, um, where the sensors are all along a bounded geographical area. You know, it's yeah. it's it's a it's an abstract concept that I think is incredibly powerful. And there's these sets of foundational abstract concepts that I think are kind of the, the minimum viable science education that um, we need to sort of hopefully um, figure out to, to teach easily. For example, um, in the 1700s, the calculus invented by Newton and Leibniz could only be understood by 10, 15 people across the world. And now it's taught in high school. So it's not only the ideas, it's the interface to the ideas that I try to um, look at as important to those ideas itself themselves ideas are nothing without the ability to grasp them as you said with the handles and, and uh, well, yeah visual. yeah well and and we we've created digital versions of those objects you know and and understanding that it's still the same thing that you know in, in a sense it's it's a it's it's an object we can manipulate and interact with and and you know, it has Are you familiar differences. with the uh, work of Brett Victor? No. I so highly recommend uh, looking at at least one of Brett, B-R-E-T, yep. Victor, B-I-C-T-O-R, um, his uh, explorations. He's brilliant. He's fun. He's kind. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's he's actively attempting to get the yeah. digital world into modeling the real and you know and, and again all models are wrong yeah it's just um, you got to know where they start and stop sure 
Um, you, one of the one of my fundamental things that actually developed over the last year of being part of the OGM calls from time to time was a concept. I, I put it in the chat because it's easy. It, it's it's kind of a you got to see it how I write it. Uh, I don't see it in the chat. It says or is it in the OGM. Oh, I'm sorry. It's, it's just in our little chat, our little disposable Zoom chat. Actually, I didn't see it there either. Okay. So hold on a but second. That, that's all right. I can I can explain it. I have one plus one. One. Yes. Okay. So that is it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. And all so right. so the concept here for me that I'm trying I'm, I'm working around is at the individual level. We are all way more like we all think the same and by think the same i mean use the same brain system we use the same so well this is an un undifferentiated mass i have right so the idea here is if we all think with dsrp just as an example let's just use that as okay if that is if that happens to be true and we all are taught that what it, what it means is that at the individual level you now have agency over understanding how you work how you function how okay then plus the understanding of one and one in this sense to me means every human is the same if you go up high enough so if you go down low enough you are all different. You are all one. One plus one plus one plus one plus one, interacting differently, agency, uh, different interests, different perspectives. If you go up to the top, when we talk about, when I talk about one there, I mean humanity as a whole, we all share what we have in common. We all have our brain. We all have our, our ability to manipulate objects outside of ourselves, our ability to communicate. And the problems to me are in between one and one. So at this level, it's like, yeah, we're all very similar in that we're all by ourselves. We all have our own processes that no one can see or feel. And at this level, we're all similar. We are all alive. We are trying to seek various things we have a brain we have we can manipulate we can communicate and so the problems are when well, we get in the middle and everybody wants to put walls between it all and it's like okay well all those little ones add up into groups that we make and it's multiple groups you're you're members of multiple groups and and it's like that's where all the problems are in the center and my goal i work better at the at the one level, which is like the like helping each individual get their voice, see their hope, see their agency, have the tools, understand, like you had said, the minimum viable scientific, you know, understanding, you know, how to tell a story, how to play a game, how to invent a game, how to think, how to build something, design and build something. You know, these to me are the fundamental tools of my thinking skills for kids um, framework that I've developed. Is if I only had, you know, a week with, with kids, what would I tell them? Well, I teach them DSRP because at the moment, I believe it's, it's, you know, this is a useful thing to have that can build into all sorts of other things. I would May teach I them. comment? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt your list. No, no, no. Sorry. Um, as a poet, DSRP is a miserable kind of yes. mellif mellifluousness. Yes. It ain't. It ain't purdy. No, it's it's hard to. It, it it sounds academic, it sounds uh, exclusionary because it's like, 
I mean, to me, if I could make it one syllable for everything, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's my goal is, is most of the, so I have, a, it's, it's a framework of about a hundred words, hundred individual words divided into subcategories. And it builds from thinking, which is the four DSRP plus mental models um, up to games, stories, and your life, the symphony of your life. And mm -hmm. what I have, what, what I had, my, my, I spent 20 years working in the productivity world. And what I found was that was all in the middle. It's how to get things done, how to make stuff, how to do strategic planning, how to, you know, that kind of thing. What I found was that the theory of thinking underpinned that for me and provided a, a base for that to sit on. And then games and stories on the top provided the, the why, the, the humanity, the reason to do it, the interpretation of our, our personal myths, our, our collective myths, our, you know, the meaning, you know, because science doesn't tell you what to do, it just tells you what things are. And then you have to integrate that into your own value system. Okay, well. I'm not even sure that science tells you what things are. The best notion that I've found about science is science is the limits of what we can say. Um, and basically, we have to remember that, you know, it is a model. It is a... Mm -hmm a communication rather than a one-to-one -one correspondence with actual reality. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, yeah. and again, we can say things better when we learn how to say them better, i.e. the calculus example, but also say the um, uh, example of uh, quantum physics, you know, used to be three people in the world understood it. Now it's in every cell phone, every computer, every chip, because we're able to apply it by communicating how things are working in the practical world based on what we've learned and sharing that communication. Anyway, I interrupted your list. I'm so sorry. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Um, I, I... A suggestion yeah. that, we, that we sort of wrap things up uh, and maybe... Yes retry um you know half an hour is a good but not a not a you know feel free to go on as, as long as you had intended to but i make the suggestion I, I would like to wrap at least my portion of this by saying that i i put a, a graphic in the zoom chat that is the top level categories of the framework that i developed and my, my goal is to create a deck of cards that enables you to use these tools. And uh, I would like to get it to, I, I've tested it on some kids and they've said that it would be, they thought it would be useful for middle to high school kind of age. Um, and my models tend to be 80-20 in the sense that they're not perfect, but most of the people I've run into are not like you and me and a lot of the people on these calls who have done their own self-exploration and who are willing to do the work of reading books and discovering. And so I'm more inclined to want to say, you know, these little things can help you and not go down the rabbit hole of, yeah, but it's missing this model and this model and that model. And it's like, well, this one, I, I'm really happy with it. <laughs> I, I think that it, it gives you a lot of roots in, in a sense, or, well, or platform, um, it gives you a lot of things to push on to say, I don't know what to do. Okay, well, Let's try to look, where do you think the problem is, is manifesting? Okay, it's well. A it's a place to start. It's that a place basically to start. has a simple pattern 
that's followable by pretty much everyone if they take a minimum amount of time to listen to about 20 or so sentences and yeah. that's great um it's uh certainly um I certainly appreciate that you keep on bringing it up and would like to find other people who have uh, their own experiences and their own reflections on it. Um, feel free to spam me um, with anything you want in terms of email. Um, I read an immense amount of things. Um, I don't know as I have, I see Vincent posted his you know, um, mark.caranza at gmail.com. I mean, I can post it. <laughs> yeah, that, that's okay. I'll, I'll just, I'll just send something up. M-A-R-K dot C-A-R-R-A-N-Z-A at gmail.com. Okay, great. Thanks, Scott. Thank and you. Are, I'm in San Francisco. You're at? I'm in uh, Northern Michigan. Does this look like Michigan or does this? Uh, let's see. Um, Does it look? It was like, yeah. Um, so a little bit the, like the thumb that. points to New York. Yeah, thumb points to New York. Yeah. So this is correct. Yeah. That's oh, correct. okay. So I, I'm I'm flopped. I should. Anyway, so yeah, I, I live up here. Wow. Uh, was Epsilanti there? Or is no, it... this is up. This is up by Traverse City. Traverse City. Okay. So it's it's kind of out in the woods. Um, it's it's sure. a bit of a vacation land, but. Yeah, that's where we are. Well, I'm smack dab in the middle of the uh, uh, what is it? Inner Sunset. It's a great neighborhood. I've got God knows how many Chinese, Japanese, um, like multiple instances of Chinese, Japanese uh, and Indian uh, within less than two blocks of my home. So it's, you know, there's there, there's the richness of the city and it takes sure half an hour for me to walk to work at the Internet Archive through Golden Gate Park on almost no asphalt. It's kind of dirt and grass trails. So, you know, I, I, walking through a little mini redwood forest in the morning, it's not a bad thing. That's that's not all bad. My yeah. my my primary, primary diversity up here happens to be an in income. Um, it is pretty homogeneous as far as race goes, but it's it's uh, billionaires living next to people who are sure. really, really struggling. Yeah, and vacation areas are like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but my most of my other types of diverse interactions happen to just be through the magic of Zoom. Best thing of COVID for me was that it it opened that world to me. Yeah. Well. Um... Uh, thank you for staying on. Uh, certainly, there are many kinds of conversations, and uh, to, as I like, as I'm just learning how to say, multi-model, multimodal. Yes, excellent. Thank you, Mark. Thank, okay. thank you, thank you, Scott. <laughs> okay. Good night, or good morning, or good afternoon. <laughs> Take care. Bye bye right. now. Bye bye.